In a country where every year thousands of violent offenders are released from prison to enter communities where they will inspire loathing and fear, who will find a way to prevent ex-convicts from reoffending, from destroying other lives and their own? Who will reach out to the worst of the worst? Only those with the courage of their convictions. I grew up on a farm. We had this kind of lovely rural community uh, that was um, rooted in the, in the church called the Brethren in Christ, which is similar to the Mennonites. Christian pacifism, simplicity, the importance of the community, the priesthood of all believers, these were very important kind of principles. Life was not just to be lived for oneself, but to be lived in, this, in service to others. Today, Pastor Harry Nye works in the service of others at a Corrections Canada halfway house. I mean, I, I don't like the word either. I think it's better to use, rather than offender, you use ex-prisoner, you know? We have a facility that will house up to 40 men, and no more than a quarter of whom are sex offenders at any one time. And I'm the only community chaplain officially with CSC, and that, that would include, about, at any one time, about 1,200 offenders in the community. So it's a crazy job. Harry works within a system where two out of three ex-cons reoffend, often committing more violent crimes. I think the problem with the system is that we don't have that human dimension. So, Mike, what, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> meaning of life. <laughs> I'm also surprised at the insensitivity of the system, the powers that crush people, uh, both victims and offenders. Harry works in a community with little interest in a more sensitive justice system. There are tons of kids. I'm very concerned. I'm sick to tired of hearing about his inmates' rights. What about the citizens' rights? These punitive and coercive solutions to the problems of crime. They don't work in the States. They won't work here. And, and they will simply lead to more brokenness. They're going to be sitting on the subways, they're going to be going to the libraries, they're going to be shopping next to us. And the question is not if they're coming back, but how will they be received again? How will someone be received back into community? The usual reception was experienced by Mike on parole after serving time for uttering death threats. I was accepted to become a supervisor of one of the malls here in Toronto, and um, they found out about the record and uh, turn me down because of it. When the world says no, Harry says yes. A lot of this work is simply spending time drinking coffee. That's what a lot of this work is, you know? Are you willing to spend a little time with somebody? You got crumbs in your shirt too. I mean, they look nice. I but am a crumb. No, you're not. <laughs> Gord spent 20 years in prison for bank robbery. I mean, within you, you carry the memories of being a, a prisoner, long-time yeah. prisoner, and, mm -hmm. a, and the violence you saw and the career. Yeah. But also within you is that little guy, part of the family. That, too, is who you are. That is who I am, yeah. Can you incorporate him, even loving him in a way, you know, mm -hmm. allowing him to, to grow, which is the more innocent part of you, the more uh, playful part of you, maybe? So what I mean is you're not only a con. So that's what I'm looking for, is to move on in life and deal with these demons, yeah. you know, the struggles that I'm having. Harry has seen what happens when the demons win. I first met Charlie back 30 years ago, and he was serving time in Millbrook Correctional Center for sexual offending. And one of the social workers had asked if we could find a volunteer to relate to him, to sponsor him on a one-to-one -one basis. So this tall, skinny kid came out, giggling and uh, and he became part of our life then. But a winter day, in spite of Harry's one-on-one -on -one support. Charlie had reoffended terribly and hurt a young boy at Christmas time and had received a sentence uh, for seven years. I left my work in 1987 very depressed and, and burned out. And one of the things was because of, of 
of Charlie. I didn't want to see another ex-convict the rest of my life. Harry Nye became a pastor and devoted several years to his church and growing family. Then he received a call from a prison psychologist. And he said, do you remember Charlie? And he said, oh yeah, I remember Charlie. Well, he's coming out. Yesterday, police took the unusual step of warning the public that Taylor was headed to a central Hamilton neighborhood after serving seven years in prison. This person is a significant risk to the community and likely to reoffend. The system opened the door, kicked him out. <laughs> and 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 uh, what's the alternative? Send him completely alone into the community? Uh, where is he to go? I think he should be locked up from now until the end of his natural life. Inwardly, I groaned, oh no, I don't know if I want Charlie back in my life. That's the, I've closed that door. And I also knew that he didn't have anybody else. Harry chooses to open the door of his home to a man others consider a monster. They're part of the human family, you know. And for us to say this is a species apart from itself leads us down a road that I think ultimately ends in ethnic cleansing, genocide, you know. Painfully aware that one-to-one -one counseling didn't stop Charlie in the past, Harry asks for help from his parishioners. Volunteers like you and me who could simply spend time, who could hold, hold men accountable, but who could also support them. Five men and women, soon dubbed Charlie's Angels, promised to spend time with Charlie every single day. In return, Charlie promises to hold his urges in check. This circle of support and accountability does not impress Harry's neighbors or the police, who scrutinize their every move. They thought we were crazy. At one point, one of the officers said to me, you know, the word in the station house is I'd, I wouldn't want to be Harry Nye in this town for anyone. The question is, will a circle of support and accountability prevent a pedophile from attacking again? Pastor Harry Nye and five volunteers keep in daily contact with pedophile Charlie Taylor. Months pass without incident, then years. Uh, almost 12 years without uh, reoffense. Yeah. It's amazing, that's amazing. Um, because everyone expected him to reoffend based on his history. Soon, other faith groups create their own circles of support and accountability. Across Canada, not only in the pilot programs here in Toronto and Hamilton, but over a five-year period that the reoffense rate is reduced by 70%, which has startled people who've worked in this. These facts and figures add up to fewer crimes and fewer victims. Tonight, if, uh, okay, good, okay, we'll see you later. Harry feels pride in this accomplishment. But then he has a new inspiration. Jesus was crucified between two thieves. The one started berating him, if you're really who you say you are, how can you get us down here? Whereas the other says, leave him alone. I mean, he's okay, we, we deserve what we have. It was this offender, Dismas. And he turns to Jesus and he says, we remember me when you come to your kingdom. And and there was no catechism, there was no grueling exam, and Jesus turns to him and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Harry lets himself be guided by his Savior's example. Call back. I just uh, wondered if you would help with kind of the uh, hosting for tonight. I thought one of the things we needed to have was a place of fellowship and of welcome and of belonging where ex-offenders and people from the various faith communities could encounter one another. And so every second Friday evening, Harry welcomes some of the most violent offenders imaginable to take part in what he calls the Dismas hey, Fellowship. Phil. Phil, Phil, hey, did Troy get to go to get his car? Assisting Harry is chaplain in training, Troy Weiland. Meeting Harry, that was actually what spurred me on to pursue chaplaincy. And uh, I believe it's a, a field that I will uh, forever continue in my life. You guys, you guys go with, with Troy. I, I don't know if there'd be room for Gary in here or not. One, two, we got some pretty big guys in here. I'm afraid you might get squashed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our, if you take these two guys, I think we can get everybody else in. Okay. All right. Shall we head them up? All right. Everybody got their seatbelts on? Tonight, as Harry transports seven ex-convicts to a downtown church. Oh, look who we've got there. It's a bunch of ex-convicts, eh? Goodness <laughs> sake. 
Enthusiastic volunteers prepare a full course meal. I love to cook. This is my life. I love cooking. I have a big family that I cook for. Oh, see, that looks much better. Much better. Is there two in here? My boss was over and said, you know, you should cook for Dismas. And I said, anytime. He phoned me a week later. The volunteers, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, lend a hand for many reasons. But for most, it started with Harry. Okay, mama, we're here. He is a salesman, I gotta admit, because uh, within a half an hour, I was totally taken uh, by him, his work, and uh, next thing you know, we were both involved. Oh, yes. Separated at That's first, right, right, we here, are, you know? we are. This is, this is my brother. That's where I'm headed. My brother. <laughs> I love him like my brother. I shot my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't always been easy. People have reacted quite negatively sometimes. What are you helping them for? They should be, you know, in jail and the sentences should be stiffer. Others think you must be crazy. Uh, aren't you in fear? I'm Sue. I'm uh, Mike's wife. <laughs> Somehow, Harry manages to dispel all doubts. When you first meet him, if, if he doesn't just touch you right to the bone, then I, I, I swear you have no bones in you. He gets you, he sucks you in, and he just does it with his love and, and comfort. Earlier today, Gord turned to Harry for comfort after a difficult experience. So you went to your home? Yes. We're out there and we're filming, and uh, you know, a few people come running out. They were really in opposition to us being there. Yeah, I used to live here, yeah. Yeah, they come up quite aggressive, so I got a little bit of aggressive. I, I backed to them, and I thought there was going to be a conflict. So uh, we started talking, and uh, the tension started to alleviate. One thing led to another, and we ended up going right into the, the apartment that I lived in. This is where I was bought up, right here. I call it the house of disrepute. That's what me and my sisters call it today because there was a lot of hookers there. They used to rent rooms to turn tricks and, you know, a lot of booze. And we were just kids, you know what I mean? But we grew up fast. This was a lot of uh, anguish and suffering, in this, in particularly in this place right here. Neglection. You know. We used to live on... Uh, bread and sugar here, man. Sometimes we had nothing. I was running around and, you know, robbing banks and involved in the drug trade. A lot of violence and, like, some serious violence. And uh, a lot of publicity on my cases inside prisons and hostage takings, major hostage takings. These violent acts added five years to court sentence. My whole life revolves around being in prison. When I first met you out in front, man, I thought there was going to be a beef, you know, the way you come gang. Man, you turned out to be a gentleman, and thank you very much for doing this, man. Really appreciate it. And listen, I would really appreciate it if you'd come up to Dismas and just check it out, man. I could just look at look in his eyes, and, you know, you could just, you know, he's, he's got pain, too. Uh, and I don't, I never got personal. Yeah. You know, it's just, but I'd like to meet him again. And I hope he comes tonight. That would be great. Gord's new friend doesn't make it to this week's Dismas Fellowship. Dinner will start without him. Okay, everybody could just sit down for a minute. We want to have a, a prayer. Ed, Ed is going to lead us in grace. Lord, we pray for your presence among us, and we ask that, you, that uh, we may enjoy each other's company. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 So it's a birthday for <laughs> And it's birthday for Chuyi in next Saturday. After breaking bread together, ex-cons and volunteers join in fellowship. When we sit in the circle, we are all one, you know. There's something about the circle that, that draws us to God, and the Aboriginal community has known that. And so when we sit in the circle and we regard each person's story as sacred, that reduces in many ways, judgment. A sacred circle of folding chairs. What can possibly happen here tonight that will keep ex-prisoners from reoffending?
Pastor Harry Nye brings ex-cons and volunteers together for Dismas Fellowship. Minute, but for those of you who are new, welcome here. To get the ball rolling, Harry's invited someone who's agreed to share a personal story. I was a businessman, for those of you who didn't know, and, and got in way over my head. For defrauding members of his church and community, Dave was sent to prison for five years. With him tonight are his wife and daughter. I didn't want to forgive him. I didn't want to ask him to be any part of my life anymore. I wanted him out and gone. And it was my daughter who actually said to me, you know, you've always been one to forgive everyone else. Why can't you forgive Dave? I remember sitting in a car with with my mom and my uncle Randy and just telling her that divorcing my father would be probably the worst thing he could ever do. But I felt anyhow, personally. Good, good girl, good girl, <laughs> daddy's girl. <laughs> I am, that, that's for sure. So I went to Dave and I talked to him in the prison and I said, Dave, I forgive you and I love you and I want to work this out. I mean, how do we thank you for just sharing your, your family? Uh, what, a, what a courageous thing you've done tonight. I just thank you so much. Unlike most around the circle, Dave is a one-time offender and a non-violent one. But somehow, Dave's story of forgiveness helps others to open up. I am Bill. And I didn't know, I didn't know too much about forgiveness. A repeat offender, Bill has spent most of his life behind bars. Because the institution I was in when I was younger never taught me anything about forgiveness like I've been I was a victim of abuse there they only taught me about violence I find often with the people that I that I walk with and care about a kind of very deep sense that, that they are worthless well uh, I've been in jail for a while now and uh, I just got out a while ago currently on parole for violent offenses Dale cannot leave his halfway house without an escort where I live, um, people ignore me, and they don't treat me right. People judge you for the wrong reasons, and uh, it's tough because it can be really hard. It's a, it's a hard road back. Jean spent 20 years of her life in jail. And every day you fight with yourself. Sometimes I have had wanted to go back because I've been scared out here. My high risk situ situation in the past was boredom and I'm not bored anymore. As well as being an ex-con, Mike is a recovering cocaine addict. That's all I'm thankful for right now, is uh, an opportunity to enjoy all this and to thank Harry and for Dismas. Dismas is a welcome change from hard stairs and cold shoulders. And for many here, it's more than that. My, my mother suffers from, uh, from a very uh, severe sickness. From day to day, I have a lot of a lot of hurt inside and I cry a lot because of because of the way my mother is right now and uh, I'm just getting by from day to day and that's it. While most in the circle seek forgiveness, for some, it's the other way around. Give me a few years ago, it would have been very easy to talk about forgiveness and to give it. As a seminary student, Chu Yi was victimized by several of her roommates. Um, I'm really struggling with that right now because I've had to face a lot of things this past year. You know, I was, I was made a victim of some really hard things. I lost almost everything. I lost my home. I was betrayed. And I find it so hard because it's like, these are people that I trusted. Many around the circle understand her pain because they caused pain just like it. I, I really empathize with, with Chu Yi because there's things you desperately sometimes want to say and you can't. And then you're on the other end, like Chu Yi is. It, it's a wide, wide gulf and why communication is so important. There's something about tonight. It is just so emotional. It is so heartfelt. There's so much love in the room tonight. Lord, hear these prayers for each person and may your embrace, hold, love, and heal to each name that has been mentioned. Thank you for giving us one another. The fragility of, of the
the offenders movement back into the community cannot be underestimated. It's moment by moment. And so when someone doesn't show up at the fellowship, I think it's kind of a red flag. What's going on? Missing from the circle tonight and for over a year is Harry's inspiration. This past Christmas, um, he didn't come, and we were surprised because we had invited him. A Christmas 15 years ago was the last time Charlie reoffended. Harry heads for his home. I took a plate of food over to his place and uh, found him on the floor. Charlie had died of heart failure. About a dozen of us or so went up to the funeral, and Harry conducted that service with warmth and good humor. We had some laughs as well as a, a few tears. If I would have died last year, would anybody be at my, fu my funeral? Nope. If I died today, would anybody be at my funeral? I know there is. Sure. I know there's going to sure. be, you know, sure. a lot of people present, you know, yeah. including my family. Yeah. So uh, we'd all be there waiting to open the will. Yeah. I always thought that I didn't need nobody. I mean, I could do it on my Did own. You? And you know, I found out differently. I can't do it on my own. I'm having more good days now than I'm having bad days. Yeah. You know, but I got people I can lean on. I mean, if you drop away from Jamie and, and Beatrice and the guys that you hang mm -hmm. out with, you'd be at risk. Right? Uh, Me too. If I, I if... know. I... Harry thinks he knows Gord pretty well, but Gord is about to take him by surprise. At the Keel Street halfway house, Pastor Harry Nye receives an unexpected visit from ex-prisoner Gord. One morning, I came to work and he's, he's, he meets me. He says, Harry, I've decided to be baptized. I just wanted to turn my life over to God. You know, I just believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe he's you know, my savior. I said, oh, oh, that's wonderful, Gordy. And then to myself, I said, oh, we've got a problem here because we didn't create this fellowship to be a church. And I explained this to Gordy. He says, but it's my church. And I said, I want you to baptize me because I know you and I trust you. And when I pushed him under this big six-foot guy, about 220, 30 pounds, you know, and I pushed his, pushed his top end down in the name of the Father, his rear end came up, and so I had to push the rear end down. <laughs> but we got him under the water, and he's a brother who's been baptized, and he's out now a year, and I didn't think he'd make it that long. The odds against me of, of, of staying out of prison are, what, three to one? and I've done it. These are men that have done terrible things, and Harry reaches out and touches them every day. So what do you do? You get, and then you follow the... I could tell you're in trouble already. Yes, or any of that. Brought them into his family with his son and his wife, and I just, he's an amazing example of, of Jesus on earth for us. God. This is the guy I was looking for. Yes. I can't tell you what that feels like. When someone says, I have friends now, or that I can live in community now. I think that when we say yes, all things become possible.